Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Donna Miller, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Purse Power. Purse Power is working to help women use their massive purchasing power to drive positive change. We believe that if women who make 80% of all purchasing decisions would choose to buy from the companies that actively promote women, and we would do that in mass, and we could create a funding stream for battered women's shelters in the process, that we could shatter glass ceilings and change lives. So that's what we're trying to do with Purse Power. And today our special guest, of course, is Elizabeth Anderson, and I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. You were I'm with so us in the honored. early days. Sorry. Oh, yeah, me too. You were with us in the early days when we first started. That's right. Yeah, I actually remember you coming into my office and getting to sit with you, I think, in our uh, one conference room and hearing about your big ideas. And it was very, very exciting. And you were just getting out there and just starting to spread the word about it. And um, yeah, then look where you are now. Yeah, yeah, it's been an exciting journey. It's still going. <laughs> okay, guys, um, everybody, we're in webinar format today. We are taping the program. We do tape them and put them up on our website, pursepower.com. It's under the Let's Share the Journey tab. We have about 90 episodes, and I post our guests every Monday for every Friday session. So you can always go register every Monday on our uh, website. People have told us over and over again how uh, impressed they are with the quality of our speakers. So I hope you take a look. Okay, let me go ahead and introduce the amazing Elizabeth Anderson. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. <laughs> so Elizabeth, of course, is the founder of Counterpart Strategies, and she is very passionate about helping wellness entrepreneurs in particular to attract their ideal clients and grow their impact and revenue. And I know you've got a mission of creating a healthier world, so that's wonderful. Um, and I know, given our experience, that everything you have to say applies to any kind of entrepreneur or business leader. You've got a lot to say to everyone, regardless of the field. They're in. <laughs> <laughs> so with over a decade of experience in brand strategy, identity design and website design, Elizabeth helps business create cohesive brand identities full of substance and soul that truly connect with their ideal customers. Uh, she also wants to help them look great, but achieve their business goals in the process. All right, here we go, Elizabeth. All right, so thank you for joining us, and I'd like to hear about your journey. Can you tell us about your journey to be uh, the founder of Counterpart Strategies? How'd you get there? Yeah, absolutely, and just thank you so much for having me here. I really am honored to be here, and it's been exciting to be have you be part of my journey along the way as well. So, um, yeah, well, my uh, entrepreneurial uh, spark happened uh, at the beginning of my career, and I was working for a software development company in Germany that wanted to create a U.S. subsidiary. And so while it wasn't, I wasn't the owner of this company, and it wasn't a, a brand new company, we were still building something new in a brand new market where nobody knew where we were, or who we were. And uh, so I wore many hats. I was the second uh, hire for that company and that endeavor. It wore many hats and, um, you know, from marketing to sales to business development to customer service to bookkeeping, which is really scary. And I told them many times this was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think that um, really gave me an appreciation for what business owners go through in trying to build something. And so I think it, it just developed a soft spot for me for entrepreneurs and leaders and business owners, as you mentioned. Um, so that that has sort of been my focus throughout my career. Uh, and then I went on to work in some local and global digital agencies, working with businesses uh, from all over of all sizes. And, um, and the one thing that surprised me throughout all of that was how many businesses really hadn't, uh, they just didn't have the fundamental information about their brands. Um, and so as marketers, we were sort of left to guess for them what they needed and what their message was or how we were going to position them. And let me just tell you, you're a social media person or your marketing director, your uh, marketing agency, especially if they're external to you, should not be making those decisions for you. Your brand is uh, so closely tied to your business strategy and really needs to be led from the top down. So uh, that, you know, as the title says, I really, I really do believe that your brand strategy is one of the most valuable assets that you can have, um, that you can invest in for your business. So hopefully today I'll have a chance to sort of explain why and help you to understand that for your own business. 
Very good. Very, very good. Guys, I forgot to say that um, I'm going to be looking at the Q&A block. If you have questions that come up, please go ahead and type them in and we'll include them in the discussion. OK. Um, all right. So how do you define a successful brand and why do you think it's so important? Why it's such an important asset? Yeah, good question. Um, first, it might help to just define what a brand is because Perfect. It seems like a lot of people have an idea of what a brand is, but maybe they're not really sure, or maybe the idea that they have isn't quite accurate. Um, a lot of people, it seems like, uh, will think of a brand as something visual, like, and maybe in the worst case, it's your logo, or it's your message, or it's one of these components. And all of those are elements of a brand and that help to communicate a brand, but your brand is really something that's intangible. It's really something that lives in the minds of people about your company or your service or your product. So it's not really something that we can see or touch. Uh, it's something that lives in their mind. It's their perceptions about you. It's their gut reaction when they come in contact with your brand. And so really it's your reputation. And um, I think that's a really it's a really important distinction to make because when you think about it that way, you begin to understand that it's what's in the customer's mind and the way that they're thinking about your brand that's ultimately going to determine whether or not they choose your company or not. And that's really what it's all about is customer choice. It's really the only way that we make revenue as a business when customers choose us. In other words, when they buy from us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and trust us, you know, with their investment. So while we can't dictate what somebody thinks about us, there are things that we can do to help them understand or help them create that perception that we want them to have about it. And that's brand strategy. Brand strategy is identifying who are we, what do we want people to think about us, and what can we do to help create that impression in people's minds so that they will want to choose us you know what's going through my mind is it's everything probably from your website to how your people answer the phone to you know your customer care to your products it's everything you nailed it yeah it's everything and it stems right from your right from your business strategy i mean they're kind of hand in hand it's like two sides of the same coin and so it really needs to come from leadership and that's why i say it really I mean, maybe your marketing people can be involved at some point, but it's really from the leadership. It's really the, the core of what your business is all about. And from there, it bleeds into every part of your organization and, and how exactly all of the touch points that you just mentioned. I hadn't thought about how big that was before. That's good to know. That's okay. <laughs> okay. That's Very good. It's so important. There. <laughs> Done. We don't even need to finish this thing. yeah we're done there we go okay so uh, what are the key elements that entrepreneurs should keep in mind when they're creating their brand strategy and brand identity regardless of the industry they're in yeah so i think it's really important um for brands to keep in mind um i think one of the key things is that it's it's not about you again it's about your customers and, and what they're thinking and it's really easy it's it's actually really unnatural for us i think to to think about things from their perspective and what their needs are. And um, so that's one of the big things. And I know if people have been listening to your podcast, this isn't going to be the first time that somebody's told them this, but it, it has to be focused on what the customer's needs are. So of course, first you start, as I said, with the core, like who are you and what are you all about? But how do we pair that with what our customers are actually needing and what they're telling us they want? What are their motivations? What's triggering triggering them to buy? Um, so that's a big one. It's like going back in order, I would say knowing who you are and what you're about, knowing who your audience is and what their needs are and what their, not just their demographics, but their, their motivations, their needs, their fears, their barriers to purchasing all of those things. Um, and then knowing how you fit in your marketplace. So it's hard to know how to be distinguished amongst your market if you don't know who they are. So who are you competing against directly and indirectly? 
having a really good picture of that and finding a way that's a that's a big part of what we'll do in a brand strategy process is research that market and really look for a way to find that unique spot to position you um think about it as kind of looking for a way to create your own category like subcategory within a category so that you're not competing directly anymore now you're this sort of only choice for somebody uh, so that's one thing and then um yeah pulling all of that together to create the um the, the message and the positioning and all of those other things that are so much fun to do the branding or the uh, design work the logos and and all of that um brings it all together you know and that's what people see visually out there mm -hmm. Well, the a unique thing for me when I first started working with you, you tried to get us to create some avatars. You had like six versions of people that we'd be aiming at and gave them names and ages and incomes. And uh, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, it was. And, you know, and I've also grown and learned since then as well and expanded on how I do that uh, really to go uh, to go even deeper into uh, understanding them. So, for example, uh, a lot for a lot of my clients, I'll actually do interviews of their clients for them. So it's it's helpful to have a third party. Sometimes I can go in and ask questions that are hard to ask about yourself. And so um, I go in and ask them questions and really, really get to understand what's going on in their minds when they're going through this buyer's journey. Um, so we like to call it. Okay, very good, very good. All right, can you share a story of a client that you helped transform their brand? Give, give us the impact of that transformation too. Um, yeah, so the, the first one that comes to mind um, is an early client of mine when I started Counterpart, and their name is The Neighboring Movement. And you can find them neighboringmovement.org, I think it is. Um, and they're a really great organization. They, um, they've been around for about five years when they found me and everything had been, um, they, they'd just been really grassroots up until that point. And they didn't really have a website. They didn't, they definitely didn't have a clear message when they came to me. Um, in fact, the, the <laughs> our process went on rather long because they had a lot of um, learning about themselves to do in the process. So they started fondly calling our sessions business therapy sessions because <laughs> ask them a lot of questions and help them get really clear on like, I mean, if you can't explain to me after like three sessions, what, like it's still not clear what exactly you do or how I would get involved or, you know, then this is a problem. So they had, they had some issues as far as that goes, if you weren't sort of already connected with them, it was very unclear. So we worked a lot on that. We worked a ton on just helping them get clear as an organization. What are you really doing? What are you really all about? Where's the focus? Who is this for? So they had a number of different programs and different audiences for those. So we did go through some work on that um, as well. And once they started, getting more and more clear it's like i could just this was so excited for me because you see the light bulb moments and i think that's what i live for where it's like they have these realizations and i see could see them almost like stand up taller and realize oh my gosh like like we're really doing something special here and oh. we know how to talk about it now and oh my gosh look at this this brand is so like official looking now it wasn't just this homemade thing you know it's so official but it's so us and it was like they just embodied that identity and all of and it's and they've just exploded since then and i don't take all the credit for that but i mean they did the work um with it you know they really went and activated it activated it in the audience in the market they built their website they started getting out there but they were so much more capable of communicating their message to people mm -hmm. and they have a really beautiful way of doing it as well with the designs to go along with it so that became a really powerful asset for them very very good very good yeah it is hard to communicate sometimes when you're an entrepreneur in particular you're drinking from a fire hose and going 50 directions at the same time to get that concise messaging yeah. and have it be consistent throughout and i can see the value something new especially that it, it's not familiar we're not just like another head 
type of headset, you know, like I'm already familiar with headsets. What's different about yours? This is something totally different that people weren't familiar with. Um, it's a really great organization. I, I would encourage people to look into it. They're helping to, um, one way we said it was sort of teach people the lost art of neighboring, like being a good oh. neighbor, like getting to know your neighbors and really how um, that's such an uh, integral part of building a strong community. Just that's get, great it's needed it's so needed right now isn't it so yeah. beautiful stuff i love it <laughs> so what are the common mistakes entrepreneurs make when they're trying to work on their branding and how can they avoid the pitfalls um yep there's a lot um <laughs> i actually have something on my website too that people uh, can go get it's i put the five top i'll break it down here too but the type top five mistakes I see brands make, but I'm going to add one to it for you. Um, the, the first that I think is there's this common myth out there that oh, branding is just for really big companies. Like mm -hmm. they have the budgets, they have the big brand assets and the advertising campaigns and the mascots and all this stuff. And, um, and that's really not true. And I think especially in today's um, environment, branding is much more needed for everybody. Um, and so like big companies definitely do have the benefit of larger budgets and the ability to create more brand assets and bigger advertising campaigns. They also have some issues too, though. I mean, bigger companies have larger, like greater turnover of staff and new people coming in, wanting to change things. You've got a lot of hands, like a lot of cooks in the kitchen, you mm -hmm. know, um, and so those can pose some challenges and actually can um, kind of counteract the benefit of having that large, they can just eat up that budget. So um, that, so actually as a smaller business, um, it is possible to, to succeed even against larger businesses. If you can uh, be disciplined in creating just one or two, like, developing over time consistently one or two good strong brand assets um that will be more effective in the long run than an overly fragmented and inconsistent brand strategy overall so which happens more often in larger companies well and it feels like with all the tools that are out there and chat gpt and dolly and all and i i I told you about another thing that I heard about today where they basically automate text and there's a face talking to you. It feels like there's a lot that little businesses can do these days that are competitive and don't cost a lot. That's true. Yeah. I mean, it is getting a lot more um, accessible, right, to mm -hmm. those things. And I think, you know, I, I, obviously I'm a brand strategist, so I'm a little biased, but I'm going to keep going back to this. That I mean, if you do that deep work up front then those assets can, then the assets that you create, regardless of how you create them with AI or by hiring somebody or doing it yourself, they're going to be much more meaningful and they're going to last you longer um, than if you're just, uh, and they'll be more effective for you than if you just throw something out there. You might get lucky, you know, but you won't necessarily know why that worked either or why it stopped working at some point. Yeah, that's a really good point. Guys, please be sure and go ahead and put your questions or comments into the Q&A block. Um, all right, so how do you strike a balance between creating a brand that reflects the entrepreneur's kind of passion on their subject and values while also communicating their offerings to their target audience? Uh, yeah, um, so we, like through the process, we'll, um, I hope I'm not just repeating myself a lot, we'll really dive deep with the entrepreneur. So if you and I were working together, we would start with me really diving in and understanding you and your, your mission and what makes you tick and why you're doing what you're doing, why, you know, purse power. Mm -hmm. And um, we would just, we would really get to know that and really draw out your passions from that. First. Mm -hmm. So now we're clear on what that is and what you're really, what are your goals? What are you really trying to create in the long run? What's your big impact that you want to make? How do you envision getting there? And from there, as we learn more about the audience and the marketplace, this is why we start with you, because we want to start with like an unfiltered version of you. 
Then we go in and get the audience information and the market information, and we start layering that together. And I use this term golden threads. I'm always looking for the golden threads that connect you with your audience. And so how can I, how can I find those commonalities between the passions that you have and the things we're hearing that your customers need? And then it becomes like this match made in heaven because you're all speaking the same language you share the same values um, that's the dream <laughs> that we're working towards well in this day and age too young people in particular if you've got to hire people they care about the passion of the company they care about what is your mission beyond just making money right yeah yeah um people aren't buying products and services anymore people are buying um you know you they're buying what you're all about and they're buying what you can do for them and their life you know especially in a first world country our priorities are more about um how are you making me more of the person that i want to be so actually when we talk about customer focus how what what's the way that you can help somebody become more of what they want to be or a better version or what are their desires and how can you help them reach that and that's that really becomes the focus and that's what people are buying people pay there was once a company e something say i don't even remember um because they didn't last but it was a competitor to apple computers at one point um and they were basically the same thing they didn't look as cool um, and they didn't really have much of a brand around them and people didn't buy it. It was mm -hmm. half the price, like $700 where an Apple was 1300 or so. And people were buying the Apple computer. It was the same thing. Didn't look as cool, didn't have the brand, didn't have the same meaning and symbolism for them and what it was gonna do for the, their identity as a person. So people are buying that and they're looking more for that from their companies and and they're more concerned with the environment and um, ethics and they want, you know, so they want to see those kind of things as well a lot more than they okay. used. Well, Bernadette uh, Sperberg has a question and I'm so glad you're here. I haven't seen you in a long time. So thank you for coming on today. Um, so she's asking, what is the cost to do this like a branding strategy? Um, and, and Bernadette, be clear if that's not what you're after. Uh, what is my cost to do this? Yeah, the, the idea of if somebody wanted to do something like this, what are the costs? Like, what are the components probably? And what's the process? And then an idea of the cost. Yeah, so um, the components, like for me, I break it down um, between I have a, a brand strategy process and I can offer workshops. Those are um, a, a less expensive kind of quicker way to go through the process. Um, which is sometimes what just what somebody needs, you know, and mm -hmm. make a place where they need something quicker. So I have those kind of offerings and I break it down between brand strategy, brand identity design, and then there's sort of the activation of that brand once we get it, which becomes website design and development and helping you to create whatever other business assets you need. For me, that comes from a graphic design standpoint. So what can we design for you, whether it's social media assets or um, collateral, like print collateral, things for events, uh, trade shows and things like that. Um, yep. And okay, then, I, yeah, and I don't want to put you on the spot I get about the, for the price, but can you give me a range from like yeah, I mean, low I end think, to high end? I think that, you know, it's reasonable to expect to spend $1,500 or more easily mm -hmm. on a logo. Um, I think that you should expect to spend $5,000 or much up to $50,000 on a brand strategy. Um, and it could be anywhere from maybe 10,000, uh, you know, depending on the size of your business, the size of the website, for example, um, so the range does get pretty large. It really just, I don't know you Bernadette and I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you have or what size it is scale. it really it really will depend a little bit on the size of your business and what the needs are there and um how how many different audiences you have for example can impact the cost of the brand strategy because it impacts the amount of research that i have to do and the number of um uh, personas buyer personas that we're creating for you so 
It can depend, but I would say like 5,000 up for the brand strategy, 1,500 or more for a good logo that's not just like somebody to just- right, perfect. Uh-oh. <laughs> Canva. So. Uh-oh, we froze. Oh no. I hope that's not me. Frozen. There we go. We were frozen there for a minute. Okay. Hopefully that wasn't me. We have had a little bit of internet issue the last couple of weeks. So okay. sorry. We'll do our best here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There we go. Okay. Good. And I think Bernadette's business. Oh, sure. You're welcome, Bernadette. I think she's got health products. Uh, so something to do with health, if I remember correctly. And I know you're very into wellness. Yes. Um, I think you focus on those kinds of businesses, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I am, I'm shifting towards focusing. I don't uh, totally say no to other types of businesses, of course, but I do really have a passion for working with wellness businesses and basically helping the healers heal more people so that we yeah. can have a healthier world. Very good, very good. Okay, uh, let's see here. So what role does website design play in supporting a brand's identity? And, and what are the elements, I wanna hear this one, of success around um, websites for entrepreneurs? Hmm. Um, so I really still believe that your website is your home on the web. This is the property you own that you can create whatever kind of first impression you want for people. So it's true. Maybe they find you on social media or somewhere else. And those things are important as well. But this is the property that you own and can make it whatever you want it to be. So we've done all this work and defined this brand and we've created the core messaging that you need to communicate for each of the audiences that you're trying to get. So let's take the time and make sure we were communicating that well on that website, visually and verbally. So um, I think there's still a lot of people that just sort of throw up a website and they don't really think too much about it. And it's like a set it and leave it. And it's just such a missed opportunity, in my opinion. And sometimes that's what you need to do. That's where you're at in your business. Just got to get something up there. But hopefully you can come back later and really invest some time in it. So I think the copy on the website, the kind of words that you're putting there are really important. Mm -hmm. um, and the, and the visuals, of course, that go with that, but really the information that you're giving, I mean, think of Craigslist. It's like the ugliest website ever. It is still very successful because it gives people what they're looking for. Um, so aesthetics are important. <laughs> the information you're giving, I think is still more important. Um, yeah. There's different ways you can communicate that too. Um, so uh, the elements, you know, I, I think those are really key. I, you know, I believe in search engine optimization as well. That's where my roots in digital marketing uh, came from. And so uh, structuring your website well, the, the whole architecture of it. And, um, and of course, then the search optimization elements such as keywords and meta descriptions and image optimization and there's just so many things that go into that but those to me are really the like key things if you will think about how your customers um, are going to use that website think about them and what kind of questions they have what are the questions that they ask you the, like what are the most common questions you get when you're first talking to somebody when they first are inquiring with you uh, make sure you're addressing those questions if you can put it in video form these days that's fantastic if you can add that supplement to it um, I think that's really helpful and increases the engagement of your site having clear calls to action throughout the site is good like don't overwhelm them with a lot of different things to do be really clear on what it is that you what is the next step so maybe throughout your site you have different calls to action but there should be a clear help create a clear path for them there's this book out there called don't make me think and i just i just love that phrase because that's what that's what we want like don't make me think when i come to your website um we're trying to predict you know with research as best as we can what it is that people are looking for and try to give that to them 
in mostly the order that they're looking for it or make it really easy for them to navigate to the other thing that they want. You know, there's a concept called the customer journey out there that I've heard of, and I think bigger businesses do it, but it's really, uh, can you define that? Because I think that's key when you think about it from the customer's perspective and their experience of it. And by the way, we're not great at this <laughs> at first power, but I'm just saying I've heard of it. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, exactly. The customer journey or customer journey mapping is mm -hmm. a really valuable process to go through. And that is what I'm describing in, um, as you, so it's one thing now we, we've, we've talked about, uh, what it is that your customers are wanting, what their motivations are. Uh, this is how we're defining some of our business strategy and our brand strategy by giving them what they need and communicating that to them. But then when it comes to the website, okay, in, in practicality and in logistical sense, like how are they going about that process? What's the flow of, of that process? So are there particular questions that they would ask along the way? And the journey defines different stages of that process as well. So Donna, you came out with something totally new. Nobody was doing what you're doing. This wasn't, you couldn't say, oh, I'm like this, but more like that, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm this totally new thing. So you had to go out and first make people aware that this was even a thing and what mm -hmm. this thing is right so they were in a totally unaware state they didn't know they had a problem or maybe they <laughs> knew they had a problem but they had no idea that this was a solution mm -hmm. until you came and showed it to them so that's you know like at the very beginning stage somebody may not even be aware that they have a problem so do we need to let them know they have a problem and that we can help them solve that all the way to, you know, I know I have a problem. I've looked for solutions. I believe this is the type of solution that I want. Now I just have to pick the, which one of these I'm going to go with. So there's a whole, uh, you know, different stages that people go through in their process. So it's one thing that can really help if you know at what stage you're meeting people, you know where to start the information. If people already know what first power is and they got the idea and yeah, yeah we're going to start at a different stage and give them a different message. So it's a really valuable tool, especially when it comes to designing your website and the landing pages and where you're hoping people will meet you. Oh, go. Yeah. 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 If people, I mean, I, I know we've got to overhaul ours. We really need to overhaul ours. I hear that out of every entrepreneur. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. okay. Uh, <laughs> what now? You and me both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yours is nice. By the way, yours is really nice. Give people the URL. I, I like your website a lot. Thank you. Yeah, I will. It's counterpartstrategies.com. Okay, perfect. All right, guys, please add some more questions in the Q&A block. Um, let's see here. Okay, here's a really good one. How Today, it's really, really competitive. And you and I were talking about this, that everybody's drinking from a fire hose. We've got data coming at us like crazy. And now you've got chat GBT creating a bunch of stuff too. It's going to be overwhelming. How can you stand out and differentiate yourself in that kind of marketplace? Yeah, um, I think we touched on this a little already earlier when we were okay. talking about, you know, finding it is what that's really unique about you and what your passions are and that those are the things people are looking to connect with um, because it is um, it is really competitive. It's very difficult to show up with something that is completely new. Bravo to you. Um, but it is difficult to come up with something that hasn't been done or isn't being done in some form. And so, um, as I said something earlier about looking for ways to create a subcategory for yourself, are you doing something in a different way than other people are doing it that's distinguishable enough? Are you, um, for me, for example, focusing on the wellness industry and aligning that with my passions for wellness is one way that I can stand out as a brand strategist, because now I'm not just a brand strategist. I'm a brand strategist with a book that helps wellness companies, you know, and probably someday that will get even more narrow. Um, as I go, I'll probably find, you know, a really good fit and, and find something that, that works, um, really well but so that's that's one way is to um look for how can you be i think the goal is sort of to answer this question like i'm the only this category that can do this for these people only one 
you know, and obviously it is not easy to get to that answer a lot of times, but, but that's what we're searching for as we go through that brand strategy is what is special about you? What is unique about you that only you can bring? And especially for smaller businesses where, um, you know, the founders are a, a big part of the business, um, just bringing out more of their personality and what's unique about them, what they value can be really helpful in distinguishing it. So, which brings me to a point about I know it's a buzzword and everybody says it and I wish I had a different word, but authenticity, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if you're not tired of hearing it, but being authentic with people, being genuine, mm -hmm. um, being open and vulnerable with people. I think that's um, what can help to set you apart and connect in a different way and, and build loyalty too, because you now have like a deeper connection with somebody. It's not just a transactional relationship. Yeah. yeah. Well, that human to human thing, I've been telling my kids, the only careers that are going to exist in the future, are either high tech or high touch, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really is the thing that we can do that other things can't, right? Is the human connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, how about having, why is it important to have a cohesive brand identity across all the different platforms? Yeah. Um, so in short, we are trying to create memories. Um, and we've got a lot of noise going on. There's a lot of stuff going out there. Our brains are overwhelmed. Our memories are overloaded. We've outsourced a lot of our memory to our iPhones or <laughs> other apps and things. But um, we're trying to create memories within people's minds. So uh, having a consistency across all of those touch points just helps to reiterate that um, if it's different every time that they see you, if I see you over here and I hear this message and then I see you over here and I hear this message, it doesn't like necessarily connect like this is the same thing. It's confusing to me and I don't know how to how, where to put that in my brain, like where to attach that. Um, so the more times that I see the same message from the same person or the same look from the same person, the more that gets ingrained in my head. And it's creating uh, what some have coined mental availability. And mental availability is that idea of how available is your brand when somebody is thinking about that issue or that purchase. So are you coming up? And the more uh, the more availability that they have for your brand, the greater opportunity you have to be the one that they choose. I don't think I did the greatest job of describing that just then. So let me know. What so it, so it's it's when you they think of you, when they think of that problem, they think of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does it take to do that? There's so many platforms. I don't I don't know about you, but like keeping track of the messages and who's talking to me on which platform. And I mean, it's just, it's overwhelming. It's really overwhelming. How do you show up in all those places and be responsive in all of those places? Yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, and so I think you have to be realistic with what resources you have. And I, I have a phrase I like to use that focused resources are effective resources. So if you, especially if you have a conservative budget or you don't have a lot of um, manpower to, to be on five different platforms, like five different social platforms at one time and responding and engaging and doing that well and consistently, don't find two platforms that you can really focus on and just do that and do that really well. You don't actually need all of the things. You need to find something that works for your business and focus on that. Like I said earlier, even the smaller businesses can be effective against larger companies with these huge budgets because they, um, it's not always the case. I mean, small businesses also sometimes like to tweak and change things a lot. But I mean, if, if you can be disciplined and stay with the same branding consistently and the same platforms over time, I think that's the way that you can be more effective. And obviously, a social media expert could help you navigate how exactly to use that particular platform and be effective on it with its algorithm changes and do you need to run ads or should you engage organically there's a lot of different 
tactics you can use, but I think at a high level, find a focus that you can do really well. So that might be social media, that might not be social media. That might be actually feet on the street going out to networking events or doing trade shows, or it doesn't have to be social media, believe it or not. People can I was gonna say that's sacrilegious <laughs> to say that nowadays. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People can be successful without a huge social media following. That's much more of a vanity metric than it is a lot of times an actual uh, impact to your bottom line. Very, very good point. I think it's easy to forget that. I uh, don't think it was a great be. And I love social media. It has its place. Absolutely. I'm using social media to some extent, but I haven't made it the, ma the major focus of my business. My goal is not to grow a bunch of followers on social media. Um, I would love to use social media to help me to connect to some of the right people. Um, and so like my personal strategy, I plan to use that more organically and look for ways to get out and actually just engage with people and build relationship, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a much more manual kind of process. Um, and there are people who can help you with this as well to kind of move it along. Um, but my goal is not to just post a lot of content and to get a lot of followers. And frankly, social media is a little scary sometimes. Um, I, I don't know if I should say, especially Facebook, but I just feel like I hear a lot more about people with Facebook pages of like tens of thousands of followers that it, it's just gone one day. Page is gone. They don't know why. It just disappeared. <laughs> there was no notice. There was no notification and they can't get it back. Um, these are real stories that happen to people. Yeah, that worried me early on too. There was something I was trying to do and, and the rules around, I think it was with Amazon. I was going, well, wow, they could just pull the rug right out from under you overnight. Yeah. 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 I used to think that was like, ah, yeah, but it probably happens like super rarely. And then the more entrepreneurs I talked to, the more I started hearing the story and I was like, oh my gosh, like it's not as rare as you think. Mm -hmm. um, and so hopefully it won't be you, but I guess my caution towards social media is, um, you don't own it. You don't own that platform. It could be gone someday. Facebook des could decide to stop being Facebook. In fact, I think they even have talked about that, um, creating something totally different. So something to look into. But you don't own that. So if you're using social media, one of your strategies with that would be how do I get people off of social media to a platform I do own? How do I get them to my website or to an email list where I can control that database. That's a really, really, really good point. Okay. Um, let's see here. So as an entrepreneur yourself, what advice do you give to other women who are starting or growing their businesses in different industries? And the other thing I'd like you to add in there is the things you foresee coming and the changes and the impacts and what we could do about it to prepare. Oh man, that's a big question. I know. I'm sorry. I just threw that at you. <laughs> all of the things, like what all is coming. Um, just what you see, what you think is going to happen with all of this and the impact to us. Of the impact of. Um, well, okay, so what I'm asking is, I guess your advice, your advice to female entrepreneurs, right? But part of that is we've just been through a tough time, the pandemic, things have changed. There's this new technology out there that's coming. And it would be interesting to think about the implications of that and how to take advantage of it if you have any insights. Okay. Um, well, I'll start with what I would say to other female entrepreneurs. Um, and I know not all women struggle with this, but I have met many women entrepreneurs who do not realize how powerful they are, how brilliant they are, how talented they are, that they are worth a lot more than they're currently charging, and they should not be ashamed to charge what they're worth. And if they do you feel ashamed? Find a coach, find somebody to talk to, to help you work through that because you are brilliant and you're powerful. And if you really are not as qualified as you feel like you should be, go out and, and find a way to get those qualifications, but know that you're capable of that, that you're worthy of that, and that you are just stand up tall girl. Like you got this. That's what I would say. <laughs> That's exactly what Chris Costello said last week with the oh, EVD with Amazon. She said she would tell herself as a younger person, you got this girl. <laughs> yeah, you too, you know, and 
I think, um, I think our perspective is really important. And this is, you know, this is part of my personal journey as well. Building a business has been a, a real personal journey for me, you know, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs find that, uh, you know, especially starting from things, something from scratch on their own, uh, you really get to learn where your strengths and weaknesses and blocks are, and you've got to decide if you're going to work through that or stay where you are, you know, mm -hmm. and so I encourage you to work through it. And if you're not sure how to do it alone, again, ask for help. Nobody gets to where they are alone. I've had a lot of help along the way, both hired and unofficial. People like Donna, who have encouraged me, for example, and just built me up and given me opportunities like being on this podcast. So we don't get there alone. Um, ask for help and do the work. Do the work on your mind and your emotions. It's so worth it. And know that there are so many good things out there for you. Like this universe is so abundant. There's no like, there's no real competition. There's plenty of, of business to go around. There's plenty of it, you know? So mm -hmm. don't be threatened by that. Make friends with your competitors, um, you know, learn from one another. I don't know, build community, not competition. That's a, that's a really, really good point. The other thing that uh, we've talked about in the past is that, you know, if I were promoting you, I could promote you all day long, no problem. And I can <laughs> tell you what you're worth, right? But when we talk about ourselves, it's tough. And so either having a friend that will tell you or talking about yourself as if you're talking about your sister or your friend, you know totally. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You got to get the mindset off of this, whatever it is, humbleness sometimes and, and promote yourself. Well, I've had to look around myself. I've had a lot of, if I'm, you know, being honest with you all, like I have a lot of insecurities. I've had a lot of issues with self um, confidence and self worth. And that's been a part of my journey. And one of the things that I had to do was look around me. Like, why do people like Donna keep doing things like inviting me to her podcast? Like, why on earth does she think I'm good enough to be on? her podcast. That's a thought that I would have had before, you know, and I'm, I'm getting over that, you know, I'm just starting to realize like it keeps happening. There's people in my life that believe in me. They keep telling me I'm smart. They keep telling me I'm doing a good job. And so I just decided I should start believing them, you know, like they're Very not, good. They're not idiots. So they must know <laughs> what they're talking about. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, we, we, we tell ourselves stories all day long that aren't true. And one of those, I mean, a lot of the times it is about ourselves and, and, and not good enough, not talented enough, whatever it is. So we need to stop those stories and challenge them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah, exactly. Like put that story to the test and I bet you it won't, it won't hold up. Right, right, right. Right, 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 so, right. And the other thing that I, I've, I, I do executive coaching too. So one of the things I, I ask people to do is keep an award drawer. So when people give them, if you write an email, say you're wonderful, or that you get some kind of award, or there's recognition or anything, stick it in a drawer. When you're feeling like that, open it up, <laughs> remind yourself, you know? I love that, that idea. Capable. I love <laughs> that idea. Um, I had one of my coaches gave, said um, I should build a list and it's called facts are friends. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's like a list of even just little wins, like little milestones for me, or, Hey, I got this thing done that I said I was going to get done at the time that I said I was going to get it done, which, you know, doesn't always happen as an entrepreneur. So like that was a big deal and just writing all of those things down. And when you get into that place where you're having a lot of self-doubt, having that drawer that you're talking about would absolutely be super powerful or a list like that would be can be so powerful just to remind yourself like no I'm actually doing some pretty good things here you know very good, very good. Well, we got a quiet group today they're not they're listening they're not asking a lot of questions um I'll give it another oh, minute good. I'll ask you one more <laughs> okay um if there were to be it's like the three top things you want us to have learned from you today what would those be um, that you need a brand <laughs> and it starts with a brand strategy. A brand is not just your logo. Um, even if you're a small business just getting started and you want to ask yourself those basic questions, who am I? What am I about? Learn about your purpose, your big why, learn about your mission and vision. Um, 
if you Google those, you'll get a ton of different descriptions about what they are, but in general, you'll find what you need. Um, so even if you're just small and just starting out, it's worth asking those questions. It's worth looking into the, com the competition, direct and indirect. And I always make that distinction because a lot of times we think um, like, oh, I don't really, <laughs> I don't really have competition because I'm doing this thing and nobody does it like me. And that's great if you have the confidence that you're that different. A lot of times in those cases, though, uh, from the minds of your consumers, they don't necessarily see it that way. They may not notice the distinction that you see, um, especially if you, I see this a lot in like more technical businesses. Consumers don't understand what you do as well as you do, so they don't catch the nuance. They don't necessarily know. So anyway, it's worth, again, really like getting to know your customers and how they see things and being able to communicate that in a way that they understand it and making sure they're getting that message. Um, so it is worth, even if you're just getting started out, um, look into the market, see how you can distinguish yourself, um, and then that you're, um, what else was it? I had something else I was say. That your brand identity is um, based on a strategy. I know I just said that, but make sure your brand identity is based on a strategy and not just like your personal preferences or the latest trends. Um, those usually just end up being um, like a sea of sameness out there, you know, like imitation is a form of flattery, but if we're imitating everybody out there, we're not really standing out, we're blending in. If I really love this particular color blue and I really want to use it as a main color for my brand, but everybody else in my market is using that or similar color blue, bummer like you find another way to use it maybe as an accent but you've got to find some you've got to find a color for example that can help you to stand out and communicate your message um I know I'm just sort of all over the place <laughs> no, it's all good it's all good so uh it looks like Evie McKellar is saying I love the ideas about the award drawers and facts or friends does that work translate to the ways you help a company find its brand voice and the confidence within that but that's interesting. So translate that that idea of focusing on what you've done well, right? And mm -hmm. facts of friends to companies. Um, hi, Amy. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Um, and good question. So sometimes it can, you know, um, if if a company needs that sort of encouragement to to recognize what it is they do great. Um, I think that there have been a couple companies I've worked with where they needed a little bit of encouragement in the same way we were just talking about for women in business to really realize the power that they had to realize like that what they were doing was legitimate. It was making a dif it is making a difference and that people will want to know about that. You should go out and talk about it and tell people about that. You'd be depriving them if you didn't get out and tell them about what you're doing. So for, for people who are not very self-promotional um, or have some, some doubts like that, uh, yeah, that can be helpful. I don't think I've ever specifically used uh, facts or friends with them, but now I'm, I'm thinking maybe I should. <laughs> you gotta do it. Well, the customer voice idea was what was coming to my mind is I was thinking, asking your customers literally through focus groups and things like that, what you do well. Now you can obviously identify what you could, could do better, but focusing on those things you do well and reminding yourself what you do well, reminding your employees perhaps what you do well. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that could be really valuable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it and it would help to maintain the focus. So um, I, yeah, definitely when we get to into the purpose of your business and start translating that down to your mission and vision and the actual, you know, strategies and tactics you're going to take, um, going back to that core like this is who we really are this is what we do really well mm -hmm. um can help to to keep everybody focused and on the same page and that is one of the benefits of of having a strategy of going through the brand strategy or having a strong business strategy too that everybody is on the same page and we're aligned with the same vision and the same values and now we're all working and pulling in the same direction and that level of focus and clarity builds excitement because it's like, oh my gosh, I know what, it's like this uh, 
cloudiness is gone and you know what you do, you know what you need to do i know who i am i know who i need to talk to i need to you know i know what i need to do and get out there and so it builds this kind of energy which builds this momentum and so it can anyways it can be a really powerful thing i got off track I get yeah, it. no no it's all good the other thing that's occurred to me as a former hr executive is is attracting people keeping people engaging people keeping them motivated it's all part of that too your employment value proposition if you've got employees is yeah. tied into this too i think absolutely and we didn't even talk about that but you're 100 right attracting people isn't just about attracting customers you're attracting employees as well and employees are looking for a place where they can match yeah. their values right okay we're we're running out of time here so i want to ask you the top three actions you want us to take coming out of here oh um shoot i feel like i just said that anyway. okay so so i, I was uh, doing most important things we wanted to learn and any other actions to take yeah. um you know take a look at your brand if you haven't ever thought about brand strategy you've never heard that before um this is some new information for you uh i would i would definitely take a look around take a look at what you're doing look at your different properties and brand assets that you have out there meaning your logos any collateral that you have your website your social media emails like is there a consistency across the board that's one thing you could look for um are you clearly communicating that distinction um is it really easy any final words you wanted to say about that in terms of actions um i don't know where it cut off so i was just saying you know it's definitely worth taking a look at your brand um and and looking like how consistent are you being how clear is your message if you're not sure ask some people not your mom and dad unless that's your target audience go ask <laughs> your audience you know and the people that you are trying to communicate to look around at your competitors how are they talking about themselves um are are they different and again indirect competitors i think is something that people often miss so um not just if as a customer depending on the, the problem that i'm trying to solve or the thing i'm going after there could be a number of different ways to go about that from like a do-it-yourself way to a hire somebody else to do it all for me kind of way I'm not sure what kind of you know products or services you're all offering but um try to think a little broader too about what are the other ways that they could solve this problem besides a service like yours um and and consider that as well as you're looking for your message and differentiation too um okay. and you can call me uh you can definitely reach out if you're curious to learn more <laughs> uh no pressure i'm happy to you know talk with you um to happy to take a quick look at things with you um let me know that you came from the let's share the journey podcast and i'll spend a little bit more time with you um but just to help you you know get a grasp on things and maybe figure out what your next step is okay give us that website one more time so it's counterpartstrategies.com okay perfect okay thank you elizabeth so much for joining us today you've been terrific i learned a lot from you as always <laughs> thank you thank you so much for having me and uh, putting up with my rambling answers <laughs> it was great it was great learned a lot okay okay, okay. So, if you yeah, yeah, yeah. so guys if you like this please join us we do this every friday our fourth friday of the month we do a networking meeting so that's live just enabling people to connect with one another across the country um if you want to support the program please go to pursepower.com forward slash it's coronavirus so you can go to the let's share the journey tab and buy us a cup of coffee. We'd love that. Um, please do like and share our social media pages. Appreciate it. And then please remember, first power, we have it. Let's use it. Take care. Thanks again, Elizabeth. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. See you bye. next Friday.